Okay, welcome everybody. I'm uh, Christian Terbofen. I'm the deputy head of the HPC uh, group here in the IT center. I was supposed to say Center for Computing and Communication. No, I was about to say Center for Computing and Communication. Since uh, February of this year, we are the IT center and we're the same people, still doing the same, have a new name and a new logo. And uh, so if you never heard of about the IT center at Aachen, this is us and everything is the same as in January, don't worry. I'm going to talk about parallel computing architectures uh, for the start. Now I will only briefly touch on several important uh, aspects. So this talk is really meant to give you an overview and I will take a high level overview at the cluster for start then look at lower level details of processors and then zoom out again a little bit because later on in the next few days we we'll probably keep with the current color scheme, right? And uh, so in the next few days, we are coming back to these topics again. Uh, when we do in the next few days, we will also have some more detailed discussions, so don't worry. But this is really to, well, motivate for some of the topics we are going to teach and uh, especially motivate for the topics that we selected to be covered in this introductionary um, week. So if you have a question in between, please do not hesitate to ask me. And uh, in order for that favor, in return, I will also ask you some questions later on uh, in my talk. You will see. So this is meant to keep you awake. As I said, I will start with a big overview of HPC system, what, what, what's, what differs an HPC system from a regular set of a few compute nodes or a few computers. And then I will take a look at some micro architecture or microprocessor architecture uh, features, then zoom out to take a look at the shared memory parallel system. That's basically a compute node. Zoom out a bit more to take a look at the distributed memory parallel system, also known as a cluster. And then we look at uh, two important things that are really a hot topic in the HPC world. Ah, let me try this option now. The last one, oh, sorry. Uh, doesn't feel good. Okay, so I'm back. <laughs> we take a look at uh, some very important topics in HPC, which is uh, addition of GPGPUs, which stands for General Purpose Graphic Processing Units, as compute accelerators uh, to these compute nodes, as well as uh, Intel's attempt in doing something, well, the same or similar. They like to use a different word, which is the Intrixion Phi coprocessor, not accelerator, but coprocessor, very important for Intel marketing. And then the end, in the summary and conclusion, I will again take a look at all the topics I covered and let you know where in this week we're going uh, to dive into details uh, here. Good. <coughs> HPC stands for high performance computing and the word performance is really important. So. When we had to define HPC some, we some, some years ago, Dieter Anmay, the head of our group, said whenever performance matters, this is high performance computing. So if, you take, if, you're, if the computation takes too long for your needs, if you have to wait too long in order to get the results, you have to improve the performance of your code, of your simulation. And this is when you start to be interested in the topics we are discussing here. If you're a domain scientist and your program is fast enough, you don't have to deal with any of this because you can just do your domain science. But uh, simulations are getting more and more important in this scientific workflow that you have to, and uh, these simulations, if you increase, for example, the granularity of a grid uh, or whatever, they take longer and longer. And if, if this is above a certain threshold, you really have to start uh, looking at HPC technologies. And the most important theme for this week is parallel programming. Parallel programming on multiple cores, multiple computers, and these um, accelerators. But before we look into details here, I want to talk about three metrics which are important uh, for performance. And these words will come uh, again and again during this week. The first is FLOPS, which stands for the floating point operations per second. And most simulations we are dealing with are not integer based, but floating point uh, based. And uh, the faster the uh, machine can execute these floating point operations, um, the faster it can deliver the result. But that's one way to look at it. The other way is to look at this is how many floating point operations per se were performed 
in a second your executable was running on our machines. And uh, the first one is this uh, peak performance of the system currently on a single node measured in gigaflops and uh, after giga gigaflops there are teraflops and petaflops and as we have seen on the previous slide the HPC community is now aiming for exaflop machines in 2018, 2020 or maybe even later, there's a big debate on it. And that's a theoretical op maximum that the machine can deliver. There will be a big, big difference of what you will actually see if you count the number of floating point operations that are in principle required to solve your problem, then take a look at the runtime of your code and uh, derive the same metric. And uh, that's what you actually see. And that's also a good way to understand how good your program is running on an architecture. I think we have examples for that on, on, um, on one of the next uh, talks during the next few days. In order to get you an idea about well, the order of magnitude I'm talking here, so I have this just one number, it's not representative. The Intel Westmere EP processor, which is a processor, uh, which is one of the two processors in our smallest uh, systems that we have, delivers a peak performance of 72 gigaflops per second. And this can be computed as three gigahertz clock rate. Then it has times four results per second, uh, per cycle, sorry. And then times six physical cores. If I didn't anything, if I didn't forget anything, we will come up with 72 as a theoretical peak. And then we have two of these uh, in s within one compute node. So the basic compute node has a peak performance of 144 gigaflops. So counting the number of flops is one way to look at performance. But we'll also learn that many, many applications, probably most of the important applications here at our university, are not bound by the theoretical peak of the system. They are more bound by memory performance. And memory performance can be again looked at in two different ways. So the first is the bandwidth, and the bandwidth uh, here on this slide is defined as a rate at which data can be transferred from the main memory to the processor and also possibly back from the processor uh, to the main memory. And again, just one number, the Intel Westme EP processor, if you have one in a single socket in the system, can uh, deliver roughly uh, 18 gigabyte per second memory uh, bandwidth. The memory latency, that's, that's the overhead that always comes when you have to do something with uh, hardware. And as soon as you want to read data from the memory to the processor, hardware is involved. You have to do something and you have to transport some information about physical wires. So there's an overhead. So the latency in theory is a delay incurred when the processor accesses data uh, that's not in the cache and it when it accesses the smallest amount of possible, basically a zero-sized data package. If you take a look, and at times to transfer this from the memory to the processor, this is about 80 nanoseconds again on the Westmere EP processor. To get a feeling about the audience here, who, who knows about these numbers? Who had looked them up for his processor um, in, I don't know, a benchmark or anything like that? Two. Okay, that's something for a start. Okay, so we'll come back to these numbers again and again because these are important to understand uh, about p uh, performance. This, uh, the top 500, just as a remark, is a benchmark um, in order to compare different supercomputers or different clusters. And the top 500 is compiled twice per year as a list, as a worldwide list of the fastest computers in the world. As I already said on the previous slide, there's no single definition of fast or performance. Uh, so that takes an artificial um, benchmark which solves a dense linear equation system. Uh, so from solving that with a gauss seidel elimination or a similar method, you can count the number of floating point operations uh, that you have to perform given the dimension of the matrix, for example. You can measure the time and this is how you derive uh, the giga, tera, whatever flops uh, metric. There's the fastest system in the world that's named Milky Way 2. Uh, in China, it delivers 22.86 petaflop as a power consumption of roughly 18 megawatt, uh, which is really uh, generating some nice power bill. And uh, it consists of a cluster of 32,000 CPUs. I, 
forget, these are probably eight core systems, and it's also equipped with 48,000 Intel Xeon Phi coprocessor. So from my very personal opinion, this is clearly a benchmark machine, so so much accelerated power is not what we will find to be useful during this week. But I don't know which applications are running there, so this is just an illustration of how the HPC community is gearing or running towards this exascale uh, goal. And the power, the power is really an important issue here, because at the end of the day in such a system, the power is the most, most cost-intensive component in running such a system for, for example, five years. That's our small, tiny little bull cluster compared to this. So we have something like 300 teraflop on uh, 25,000 cores. Uh, that's just the core part of the bull cluster. It doesn't count any extensions. It doesn't count all the accelerated part. And uh, at the moment, we are starting to write a proposal to get a new machine. We expect some hardware to be, deliver to be delivered by the end of next year. And then in 2017, 18, uh, some more hardware. So we are catching up, uh, or we are trying to catch up, but uh, for university we will always aim to be ranked in this top 500 list between place 50 and 100. So the last installation was better when this was uh, first submitted to the list. It was ranked 32, I think. Um, but for the, that was back then the fastest system for any university in the world, so we're doing good, but uh, we are a far way uh, of well, a good way apart from this uh, top one system. However, and that's the point of this slide here, the programming models that we will learn on this machine are exactly the same here. So it's a cluster of many nodes and many processors. These are multi-core processors. We are going to program with OpenMP. We will learn how to vectorize. We will learn how to make use of accelerators and, of course, uh, with OpenMP vectorization and the accelerator programming models, and we will learn how to use MPI in between the nodes. So whenever you aim for a system uh, like this or like this, you will hear, you will learn uh, the necessary programming models. It's only an introduction, it's only so much you can uh, teach in within one week, but we will do our best in order to tell you about the most important uh, concepts. And this is just an another data point so that, that what we are talking about here is relevant. So that's the processor architecture share in this top 500 list. And if you take a look at this one, 40% plus 27%, plus 4%, plus not this one, plus f another 4, another 5, another 3, and so on, uh, the, the majority of the systems is all x86. Some processors are newer, sometimes they are slightly older processors. Some people actually still go for AMD-based system, but it's x86, multi-core, that's the basic part of the compute, uh, or the most important part of these compute nodes. And, uh, well, the top 500, or the systems in this top 500 list have been growing in the last few years by just adding up the number of cores, so meaning putting more and more compute nodes, putting more and more processors in a compute node, the number of cores per processor is going up and then there are even accelerators. So the largest system has, I forgot this, something above one million uh, cores. They probably count the Xeon Phi cores from the um, Milky Way system in China. But uh, so the number of cores is really exploding if you take a look at this um, over uh, time. That's really important. And um, this will lead me to some other conclusions uh, at one of the next slides. If you sit back with your program that's either serial or is just capable of exploiting your two, uh, dual core or maybe quad core processor, you will not profit from industry developments. So industry is adding, mo is adding more and more cores. They're adding features like vectorization. And there are also these accelerator features which we think sooner or later will merge within the main processor. So you have to acti actively use these technologies we are going to talk about in this week in order to profit from these uh, industry innovations and make your program run faster. And that's another view from our uh, about our cluster. I think Tim will have a more detailed talk on that, um, uh, well, in 45 or 60 minutes from now. Um, we have a partition of MPI nodes, this is how we call them, so because 
This is mainly intended for MPI parallel programs. These nodes consist of two socket machines with exactly this Intel Western AP processor I was talking about. And we differentiate between small and large, and the difference here is the main memory, the memory per node. So the small nodes have 24 gigabyte main memory, the large nodes have 96 gigabyte of main memory per compute node. And then we have the SMP section. SMP stands for shared memory parallelism. Um, yeah, in this notation, we have significantly less machines of this type. They have more sockets. <coughs> um, ah. We have four times four. Sorry, that's not intuitive. So we have this BCS type of machines, which consists of four nodes, and each node has four processors, so we have 16 processor times eight cores in this machine, so um, you can really do shared memory programming here, and the small uh, variant here has 128 gigabyte of memory, the large one has 512 gigabyte of memory, and for really demanding shared memory applications, we have uh, what we call the VSMP or the scale MP machine, there we have 16 times four processors, which then offers four terabyte of main memory for a single application. And we also try to teach a little bit about this cluster, cluster, and you should understand which part of the machine should be the right one for your application. Good, that was a big overview about how clusters are configured. Are there any questions at the moment? Who used the uh, RWTH compute cluster previously? A few of you, okay. So I will now take a look at some microprocessor architecture features and then zoom out, as I said, over the compute node, MPI, and then accelerators. In computer science, there's what we call the von Neumann architecture. So that means the program and the data are sitting in the same memory. That's an important invention, uh, which led to these machines, which are highly usable as they are today and highly flexible. And um, <coughs> from a programmer's point of view, you write your code in C, C++, Fortran, or any other language, and then there's a compiler that compiles this code into machine language, or there's an interpreter that uh, generates machine code uh, while it interprets um, your other uh, high-level language uh, code. So that means these instructions first have to be fetched from the memory to the processor, will be brought to execution, and when it's brought to execution, the data also has to be fetched from the memory to the processor. It's really important to understand data and the program are not per se always available in the CPU. It's all in the memory. It has to be taken to the CPU. CPU has very limited storage. And if it has to get the next chunk of data, the first chunk has to be written back, typically the result. And that's a simple diagram of such a machine here in the top end. Let me see whether the mouse pointer works. Yes, here we have the core. And there we have the memory. And as I said, everything has to be taken from the memory, processed in the core, and then data has to be written back uh, from the memory. Actually, it's a slightly more complicated because I don't have any I.O. here. Like, the result sooner or later should be probably written back to disk or brought into the cave uh, to analyze it or whatever. You will do, hopefully, something with the data you computed. What's the problem in this architecture? And this is now where I start to ask questions to you. What's the problem in this architecture as it is today? What's the main issue we are facing? Or what do you expect to be the main issue we are facing throughout this week? Yes. Access to the memory, OK. And you said? Okay, yes, that's also probably what you meant, right? Okay, right. Uh, as it turns out, I think I have some slumbers on numbers on the next slide. The cores can process data much faster than they can actually load data from the memory and write it back afterwards. So that's, that's a bottleneck, and sometimes it's called the Van Neumann uh, bottleneck. And there's an illustration uh, from John Hennessy, um, David Patterson, uh, they had a talk on it. They also have a great book on computer architecture. If you want to really understand everything that's going on 
when your program is executed on any of these recent architectures, their computer architecture book can explain everything, but you should reserve some time to really need it because it's big and it's, it's really detailed, but it's a clear recommendation if you want to learn more about these issues. And what they are plotting here is the memory performance in terms of latency and the processor performance in terms of floating point performance as relative improvements um, over the system design, uh, uh, over a reference design from 1980. So I don't know exactly what they were using in 1980, uh, but uh, the interesting result here is that the CPU in well, had a slow speed up phase of something like an improvement of 1.25x per year until 1986, then it accelerated something like 1.5x improvement per year until 2000, and then it flatted out a little bit, 1.2, uh, until 2005, and since then it's more or less flat on a per core basis. So what happened exactly there, we will come to in a few minutes. So there's a significant performance improvement in terms of processor floating point capabilities. And there's only a slight performance improvement in the memory latency, which is uh, about 1.07 improvement uh, per year. And to the best of my knowledge, there's no technology on the horizon that will jump this up or will bring this up to there. So the CPU core is much faster than the memory, and this will stay so for a while. I said here per core because, and that's what I emphasized on, emphasized earlier on already, it's really important that you go parallel because otherwise you will not profit from these uh, newer chip uh, features because what vendors are adding uh, are multiple cores. And this is what computer science, uh, well, or computer architecture science added, and that's also a technique well known in computer science. If you can't load data fast enough from the memory to the CPU, you put in something like caches uh, in between. What's good about caches and what's bad about caches? That's a question for you again. What's good? Right. Caches are fast, but they are small. So there are certain levels of caches we generally call them level one cache, level two cache, level three cache, and, and uh, well, depending on how many levels we have in the machine. And the higher le the level, typically the larger it is, but also the slower uh, it gets. And this is really because uh, fast memory is expensive. So in current architectures, we have three levels of caches directly integrated into the processor. L1 cache and L2 cache, you by now, being defined per core, and then we have a shared L3 cache that's shared among all the cores in the architecture. Uh, current systems, uh, only very few of them have off-ship cache, and here we have the memory. And uh, well, the uh, small L1, L2 caches are order of kilobytes, L2, L3 caches, if they are larger, are order of megabytes, and the memory, I'm sure you're aware, is order of gigabytes to hundreds of gigabytes. So unless your working set, so the data, your kernel, your solver, whatever works with is really small and fits into the cache, you're, you really have to do the, you really have to uh, be aware that data has to be loaded from the memory through the cache hierarchy to the core and back, uh, results written back from the core to the memory. Which data should reside in these caches? Yes. Absolutely. Anything you have to access multiple times. So if you just modify data, uh, read data, do something with it, and write it back, caches don't help you. Actually, they add some latencies, technically. So the caches only work for your code if you access data again and again. For example, the left-hand side or the right-hand side in a linear equation system solver often can fit or stay in the caches, within the caches, during the whole time of the solving. And there's a common technique in order to exploit this, which is named blocking, so that you can reuse some, um, uh, some data uh, in your algorithms. That's a very low-level tuning. We are only to have some remarks on uh, today and uh, also on Wednesday. Uh, we could spend a whole week just on serial tuning and optimizing for caches, but we're not going uh, to discuss this here in too much uh, detail. 
<coughs> but this is meant to illustrate uh, the effect here. So that's that's a, a pointer chasing benchmark, and it, it prints the latency uh, on the system in terms of the memory size. So memory size is a region of memory which is initialized in such a way that I can take one address, dereference it, and it points me to the next address. So I take the next one, dereference de it, and it points me to the address thereafter, so that I run through this memory in a ring-like fashion. So I'm chasing always the next pointer, hence the name of the benchmark. And I can control how large uh, this memory region is here. And as long as it's pretty small, like it fits in c l one cache on this particular architecture, I have a very good performance, so that's uh, my latency. Um, when it gets larger, it doesn't fit into the L1 cache, so it has to, data has to be loaded from the L2 cache a few times during this iteration. When it then gets larger, it doesn't fit into the L1 and L2 cache, so data resides in the L3 cache. So we see performance is going down, and then if it gets too large, data has to be loaded from the main memory. And um, well, this is really to illustrate there's a, there's a cache hierarchy on the system that's measured on the Intel West MEP um, on one of our systems. And you can exploit or you can really see the performance behavior differences whether you're accessing data from L1, L2 cache, L3 cache, or from the main memory. And of course, if you only if you have a solver that works like in L1 and L2, and every I don't know every now and then you have to fetch something from L from the main memory, that's okay. But in your if in your kernel you're constantly fetching data from the L3 uh, from the main memory, and the caches don't work for you, your performance will be significantly uh, bad. So I hope that that illustrates uh, this cache hierarchy feature. Does it make sense? Okay. <coughs> Just one remark on the memory model. So I'm a C, or I actually I'm a C++ programmer. So I have, uh, especially on Wednesday, I have examples in, in multiple languages, but I prefer to explain uh, the C examples because yeah, it's more natural for me. And there's an important difference between C and Fortran. So Fortran takes a different way of storing the, the data structures in the memory meaning multiple data structures, sorry, storing multiple data structures in the memory. In C, if you iterate over a uh, two-dimensional array, like shown here, you have to increment the outermost, uh, uh, outermost dimension or outermost index first in order to get a better cache behavior, because if you get load this into the memory, we will talk about cache lines in a second, there are high chances that this one will be in memory uh, already. If you would iterate the, fir the, the, the first dimension first, you have to load this one, and then you would load that one, and that would mean there are less chances that it's already in memory. And in Fortran, it's just the opposite. So you have to iterate over the first, uh, first dimension, and then you have to iterate over the second uh, dimension in order to get <coughs> sorry, uh, the better cache-aligned cache uh, behavior. I hope Fortran, who is a Fortran programmer here? Perfect. So there are Fortran people. We have also Fortran experts that are going to help you if you need help. Paul is standing in the back, so don't hide yourself. He's our Fortran expert. <laughs> and um, so for Paul speaks this, this notation, I speak that notation, and you as a programmer should be aware that there are differences, which are particularly important if you're calling libraries, like linear algebra libraries, from the other language. You have to understand what's going on. Good. I said that uh, the performance per core increased until about 2000, 2002, or whatever, and then it flattened down. So what happened there in computer architecture? What was the problem? Why didn't the performance increase any further? Yes. Too much waste heat. Where does the heat come from? Oh. Okay, so the statement was there was too much waste heat. We couldn't go above something like close to 4 gigahertz 
in order to still be able to cool the processor. So what the computer industry did for a long way was to increase the pipeline length. So an uh, instruction, like an uh, addition of two floating point operations can be split into many different phases. So like getting the instruction, understanding in the CPU what to do, getting the registers right, perform the op instruction, writing it back to the registers and things like that. So it really depends on the microarchitecture. So these instructions were getting longer and longer so that we can overlap multiple instructions and execute them at once. That or simultaneously, sorry, that's the right word. That was one way to improve performance. The other was to increase the clock rate. So if you can increase the clock rate, you can do multiple instructions, um, or more instructions in the same uh, time. But in order to increase the clock rate, the, the problem was really to differentiate, to put it simply. So I'm, I'm not a computer architecture person, I'm not a physicist. So the, to differentiate between the one, like power on, and the zero, the power off. So there's a certain, uh, you have to differentiate between the two states. So it's, it's binary technology. And in order to be able to do that at faster and faster frequencies, you have to put in more power in order to get stronger signals. And putting in more power also led to the problem that you couldn't deduce the heat from the processor. So the heat from the processor is really a problem because the processor is not a simple 2D structure, it's a very complex 3D structure. If you have too much heat in there which you can't get off, you either can't differentiate between 0 and 1 anymore because the heat itself is some energy that you could misinterpret. Electrons could jump in between different lines and many um, other nasty things could happen because this, the, the circuits on the processor are really small order of 20, 30 atoms, and then there's 20, 30 atoms of nothing, and then there's the next structural element. But what allowed to increase the frequency to make the architecture more and more complex was uh, what many people refer to as Moore's Law. So Gordon Moore was one of the founders of this uh, company named Intel, which I assume every one of you have, has heard of. And what he said was uh, like, we are able to improve the processing techniques, uh, uh, well improve them so that we can put twice as many trans transistors on the same chip size every 18 months. So I hope this sentence makes sense. So every 18 months, the, Im uh, the factoring technologies were improved such that, that Intel was able to integrate twice as many processors. So that allowed uh, to deliver more and more, uh, more and or complexer and more complex uh, processor architectures. So I said we don't see higher clock rates and I state Moore's law is still valid so they can still improve. What is Intel and other companies doing with the added transistors? So imagine you're this, this big company Intel, you have this Wonder wonderful Pentium D design. I think that was the first one uh, of these processors. You have this Pentium D at 3 gigahertz and all your plans for these 5 gigahertz, 10 gigahertz processors, which you already announced, you can all put them into the waste bin because you can't cool these processors. You have that and now you can do twice as many transistors on a chip. What, ca what can you do with it? You put two on the same chip. And this is how multi-core processors were started. So the first Intel dual core, I think, was the Pentium D. Uh, I don't know what D stands for, but certainly not dual core. Uh, so they had, they just replicated the same processor. And you could really see it in block diagrams. It was just a replication. So there was no sharing of caches, no sharing of passes to the memory. Everything was replicated just because they were able to increase more transistors on the chip. And this is what you still see. Intel has a TikTok model. I think I have a slide on that uh, in, in a minute. Uh, that means every, um, well, in one year, they add some microarchitecture improvements, do something with the memory controllers, things like that. And in the next year, they just add more cores. Nowadays, not all the added transistors go into cores. They also go into caches. So caches have increased significantly in the f last few years. And this is what this figure is saying. So the number of cores started to go up and the number of transistors in a chip can still increase. The single thread performance is about to stall 
Many people think it will go down a little bit. We'll see the frequency certainly stalled and actually it's going down because two lower clocked cores are more efficient than one uh, clock, uh, core running at, the, at twice the clock speed. And uh, this is also really the problem, the typical power. Uh, so there's this th uh, thermal design point, meaning the power the processor is allowed to, to draw from the main board is around 125, 130 uh, watts. So that, that's a technical limit that most of the industry has settled to. So we will see more of these core ed uh, cores added. And in the last few generations, we have also seen uh, that more and more vector units are added. More on that later. So that's, that's now our, well, in my simple diagram style, dual core system. Of course, there are many cores, but they would just complicate that figure. Memory, caches, and two cores. Does it solve our main problem, the memory problem, in any way? No. It makes it probably even worse. So if, if this here is a bottleneck, and I'm adding more compute power on the other side, like more cores, that doesn't help much. So we also needed different system uh, designs. But uh, well, for some, there's a software solution. So that's multi-threading um, and uh, chip multiprocessing. So all the uh, different vendors have different terminology uh, for that. So chip multi-threading, um, chip multiprocessors, processing, multi-cores, whatever. That all refers to the fact that you have really full cores and multiple of them on a processor, and that they are simultaneous multi-threading or just multi-threading or like Intel calls it hyper-threading. That means you're just replicating parts of it so that you can execute two processes or two threads or whatever on the same resources. So you have basically two sets of registers. You can switch between them very fast, uh, but you only have one floating point unit which is shared uh, by these multiple threads. So what's the idea here behind these techniques? Any idea? Why do I want to execute multiple threads at the same time? Why would that make sense? If I'm, only sh if I'm still sharing or if I'm sharing my floating point and integer units? Yes? Perfect answer. So one thread is waiting for the memory access while the other is um, uh, well can be put onto the processor. So let's try to be illustrated here. That's that diagram. I, is I stole it from some slides of a company back then called Sun Microsystem. So they had a four-threaded architecture, and um, uh, it was executing four threads on a single core. And the idea was, if the data is ready, do compute on one thread, and if it then has to wait for the next mem next data switch to the next thread, which hopefully has the data ready. So the idea is to really overload or overlap the computation and waiting for the memory. And if you take a look at that in the big scale, this is eight cores, four threads per core. This is the idea uh, of how you should try to imagine how to program uh, such a system. Of course, this puts a lot of load on the memory system, memory subsystem. And this is now how when we switch to shared memory parallelism, uh, there was a big design shift. If you uh, take a look at how compute nodes were built in, I think, 2008 uh, time frame. So that's an old diagram of an old Intel Woodcrest based system. It was the Intel first real dual core system. Two sockets, they were connected via what Intel called the front side bus uh, to the memory. So what's the problem here? I'm not adding more cores. I'm also adding a second processor to the memory interface here. So I'm really, uh, well, making my bottleneck uh, worse. This front side bus architecture uh, had a very low memory bandwidth. It's very nice because from all the core, it's really symmetric. So from all the cores, the distance to the memory is the same, same latency, same bandwidth. But uh, this front side bus here, I'm not sure whether that's the right pictogram for how it's technically implemented, but it's a bus and only one can be active at a time. Uh, so this was clearly a limitation. 
So AMD was first in the, oh, sorry, I have to explain one more uh, thing. So shared memory systems are now intended so that you have the data here in the memory and you have multiple threads that the OpenMP programming, multiple threads running on the cores, they're all going to modify the same shared memory. How do these threads communicate with, is with each other? All these systems are cache coherent. That's sometimes when we draw diagrams uh, what the CC stands for. And that's, that's sometimes a complicated topic. On Wednesday, Root will talk about possible problems, performance problems called by this co uh, cache coherence. But if we don't have cache coherence on an x86-based x86 based system, things would awfully go wrong. So assume this, so there's one thread, it writes to an array, A at the element zero, my favorite number 23. There's a second thread which writes to this same array but at a different position, uh, my second favorite number 42. There's some synchronization and later on thread one will be able to see what thread uh, two has written and vice versa for thread two. So that's not done in software that this is possible, that's done uh, in hardware. And uh, for some of the performance discussions this afternoon, especially on Wednesday, also on Friday, we have to understand what's going on. Elements of array A are stored continuously in the memory. So uh, A is large, let's assume a few megabytes, and A is stored in the memory. I talked about the different ways of storing multidimensional arrays uh, between C and Fortran already. So it's stored in a continuous block of memory. When this thread executes A0 equals 23, assuming that A has been initialized previously, the data will be loaded into the cache, meaning A will be loaded into the cache. But current systems are organized in so-called cache lines. So not only A0 is loaded, but depending on your system, blocks of a certain size, which we call a cache line, will be loaded. An x86-based system, that's 40 by for, uh, 64 bytes. So that means we can have 16 integer elements, A0 to A15, within one cache line. A0 and A1 are stored in the caches of the threads, and if they run on a different system, in different uh, cores or different processors, this synchronization mechanism has to make sure that the results are written back to the memory so that when this is executed, A0 has to be loaded uh, from the memory. Uh, A1 has to be loaded from the memory again. So if they are on the same cache, no problem. If they are on different caches, after the synchronization points, we will learn what these are in the programming languages on Wednesday. After these synchronization points, all the threads have a consistent view of the memory again and can see the um, intermediate results from the other uh, threads. And that can be a performance problem, and that's what I'm trying to illustrate uh, here. So that's uh, assuming A0 to 4 are stored here in the memory, so it's at a small array. And the first thread here is now loading, uh, adding 1 to A0. So the data has to be loaded from the memory into the cache, or actually then the uh, registers of the processor where the addition operation is performed. And it's only written back by default when the data has to be evicted from the cache because something else is loaded into the cache. However, on our multi-core system, though, there's now the second thread performing A1 uh, plus equals 1. So writing at a different element, there's no data raise, it's a correct program, but the data has to be loaded, uh, has to be sent from this core back uh, or over to the other core. It's performed uh, in hardware. And uh, so at the moment, this one is performing the first plus one operation. It marks the cache line as dirty. And if this one is trying to uh, load the cache line, it knows, oh, well, this is dirty. So the cache coherency mechanism is taken care. So the data has to be transferred over. If now the third thread is writing over there to A2, and then the fourth set is writing over there to A of 3. I hope my great fancy illustration made that clear. There's a performance problem involved. And uh, I think that's an illustration for when you need a rough understanding what's going on 
in the hardware architecture when you start to understand the performance of your program. You don't know all the you don't have to know all the ugly little details, but uh, this basic uh, understanding of uh, how caches work, how pages in the operating system work, things like that, um, that's important. So that also relates to network properties, which we'll discuss to, uh, tomorrow, and uh, caches and pages will be dis discussed on Wednesday. And uh, sometimes you're lucky and you don't have to deal with this, and your program just scales fine, but sometimes, or in many cases, you're not lucky, and you have to understand a bit of this in order. Um, to make this work correctly, or faster, sorry, not correctly. What can we do here in order to speed up this code? It's a general question, so a general answer is fine. So you, you have no idea what's going on with these arrays, obviously. Yes? Perfect. Yeah. So the answer is that each core is doing the computation on one cache line. Yeah. So that's w one very good option. So we can introduce something like blocking, so that we understand how the different threads access the data, and that there's no what we call fault sharing, as I demonstrated here, going on. We might introduce padding, so that there's unused room or space in our data structures, so that uh, don't not two threads uh, compete for the data. Or we have to really think about our data structures. Are they really structured in the right uh, way uh, so that we can uh, get nice performance? And sometimes the guidance from object-oriented programming books and things like that are very nice to structure your code and, and to maintain it, but are not well suited for today's uh, cache-based uh, architectures. Because sometimes you really have to split up the data structures if you're, for example, going to modify only one component very intensively by multiple threads. Okay, so that's just as a general explanation. Good, but I said there were some design shifts in order to get better performance. And this pictogram here tries to illustrate that. So what we don't have here anymore is this bus-based interconnect, uh, bus-based uh, thing. We now have something which I just referred to as an interconnect, and uh, my particular example is an AMD Optran based system, a very old one, but this was one of the first systems introducing this architecture. And what AMD wi did with the hypertransport is to introduce a NUMA architecture. So we still have this cache coherence, but we have a non coherent memory access. I'm trying to illustrate this, he this here. So if this core accesses data that's uh, located here, it has a higher bandwidth and a lower latency um, as compared or then compared to when it has to go via the interconnect to data that's located over there. So depending on, on the relation of the data to the core, you will see different uh, speeds in terms of bandwidth and memory. And the system works well if all the cores access local memory, meaning memory that's most close or closest to them. So if these two cores here access data here, and those two cores access data there. It works really, really bad if these two cores have to go via the interconnect to data there, and if those two cores have to go via the interconnect to data over here. Then the interconnect, again, is a bottleneck. If it everything works well, well, the added memory partitions also add bandwidth, and typically on these NUMA systems, the number of NUMA domains is also the factor uh, over the bandwidth compared to a single socket system. Of course, there's some slight overhead in the interconnect uh, as well, but that's just uh, as one number to get you an idea. We'll talk about that in detail on Tuesday, because every multi-socket system already is a NUMA architecture. Oh no, we talk about it on Wednesday because every NUMA uh, architecture, uh, every two socket or multi socket system is a NUMA architecture. Some processors already in a single socket configuration expose a NUMA architecture. At the moment, this, these are, well, only in parentheses, some Opteron based systems, but future Intel based processors can also be configured in different zones. Uh, or partitions or whatever. Um, Intel Marketing doesn't have a name for that yet. So then there will be multiple, like two or four NUMA domains uh, per 
Intel processor as well. So even a single socket system uh, has some of these NUMA properties. And again, the good thing is if memory can be accessed independently, you have a, a significantly higher memory bandwidth if you access memory in the wrong way, uh, memory uh, bandwidth improvements uh, are not likely to, to happen. And you as a programmer, did you ever think of where data is allocated? What happens here? What happens if you do a malloc in the operating system? Yes? Okay. Yeah, you said we can't predict. Okay, so what happens in the operating system if we do a malloc? The application basically says, I am application so and so, I'm needing this amount of virtual memory. And the operating system says, okay. And that's about it. So it just makes a some entry in some page table data structure and that's it. So applications today work with virtual memory. Only if you as soon, so that's, that's malloc here. Only as soon as you're going to write to that memory, to really use it, the operating system has to do some actual work. So what it does here is I'm writing to A of zero. Ah, so here's the connection of the virtual memory address, which has been taken from uh, or retrieved via this malloc call, and it now has to make a connection of this virtual memory address to a physical location. And that's done by so-called pages. By default, the page is four kilobyte in size on Linux, but you can also change that uh, uh, the, the, the page size for your application. So it means as soon as you write to A0, a four kilobyte block of memory is actually allocated on physical memory or reserved on physical memory and the link is made to this pointer structure. And as soon then you write to A of 1 and so on, so all the data goes there and only when you reach this uh, 4 kilobyte barrier, uh, the next I of 1 which is above this barrier again triggers what is called a page fault. So that means the operating system has to come up with some memory and again it reserves a physical memory spot for your application. <coughs> so at the allocation point only a few things or there's only some entry in the data structure. There are some alloc calls which already perform the memory or initialize the memory with zero. So then they already perform the initialization. If you just do a plain malloc on current Linux, um, it doesn't do any initialization so you have to do it on your own. So only here it's derived on where the page will be located. And by default, operating systems try to um, apply clever um, uh, heuristics. And what Linux and many others by default are doing is what they call first touch. So they put the data as close, to pos as, close as possible to the location from where it has been first touched. So if this initialization is executed here, data will be allocated there. If it's al in um, executed here, data will be allocated there, always assuming that there's enough or sufficient free physical memory available. What can we do? We will emphasize this on Wednesday. So if you parallelize the initialization, we can distribute the data. So we distributed this initialization over multiple threads, and so uh, a thread is running here, we'll make sure that some pages allocated here and the thread running there will make sure some pages are allocated there. That's a simple trick. It only works if you know how to access the data in your parallel computation. It assumes that you're not changing uh, the way the data is accessed, things like that. We will cover uh, other aspects in more detail on Wednesday. But again, there's something uh, important to be understood how operating systems behave in order to understand performance on these architectures. Does this NUMA thing make sense? Are there any questions? Okay. <coughs> so that's a stream benchmark. I just picked some numbers. I hope they are up to date. And I didn't write the size of my array, so I'm not sure. So I can't verify them on the fly. 
So what I'm doing here is I run the stream benchmark, which is a benchmark written to measure the available memory bandwidth. It performs four different operations, but I'm only looking at the vector assignment, which is a very simple operation. So it just assigns a vector B, the values of a second vector. Uh, sorry, it just assigns the values to a vector A from a second vector uh, named B. And if you know the dimension and if you take measure the time, uh, you know that it goes to the memory, uh, from the memory to the CPU and back, so you can compute the memory bandwidth of this kernel. I didn't use processor binding in these gray variants, and I used some binding schemes offered by the Intel runtime in these blue and red variants. I will talk about more on that on Wednesday together with Root. And here I also performed this NUMA aware allocation, meaning I parallelized the initialization of the arrays in the same way um, as the computation is performed. Again, with these two binding schemes. And I'm using the Intel compiler here, but you can do exactly the same thing with GNU. So for one thread without binding performance is uh, unluckily pretty bad because I guess uh, the thread was uh, shifted to a different core by the op Linux operating systems. All the other ones deliver uh, something like the same uh, memory bandwidth. For two threads, well, the no binding one was a lucky winner here uh, over these uh, three others. But this version is already much uh, faster. So scatter binding here means put the threads as far apart as possible. And that means for two threads, I put one thread per processor. And if you remember my NUMA pictogram here, there's one memory partition always attached close to one processor. And this is because the memory controller is located on the actual processor. So if the two threads access uh, are distributed over two processors, meaning we can make use of uh, two memory partitions, and we have distributed the memory in the same fashion, then we get a much higher memory bandwidth than when all the data was initialized in serial and resides on just one single um, uh, NUMA node. And this continues, and this green one only catches up here at the end, uh, because compact means you put the threads as close together as possible, meaning two threads will run on the same processor. We have a sixth core processor here with hyperthreading enabled. Uh, so um, here we're still on one processor with 12 threads. We're still on one processor. And only here with a compact uh, scheme, we go to the next uh, processor socket. And this also illustrates that thread binding alone is not sufficient. You also have to make sure that data is allocated where it should be. And there are these tricks that I um, well, hinted on with this parallel initialization, but there are also other tools in Linux uh, that we will talk uh, about. And clearly, there's a performance different. So if you do difference, if you depend on memory and you get 35 gigabyte per second, your program will run much faster than if you just get uh, 18 gigabyte, which you can get on a single socket. And this is what I meant with NUMA. If data is accessed locally, independently from each other, you get this increase in the aggregated memory bandwidth. Uh, if it doesn't work well, uh, NUMA performance uh, do not deliver improved performance. Uh, NUMA architectures do not deliver improved performance. And this is now a block diagram from a whole system. So our uh, f from a whole processor. Sorry, our Nihalem architecture is an eight-core architecture. Every core is capable of running two threads. So this one here is a core. L1 and L2 cache are per uh, core per physical core, there's an on-chip interconnect which connects all these cores to the shared L3 cache. And here on-chip is also the memory controller and this is where three channels to the memory are attached to. And uh, then there's what Intel calls a quick pass interconnect that's similar to the hypertransport on the opterons. And this is how the communications to other processors appears. And this is what the NUMA uh, this is what forms a NUMA system. So if you have a second or more core uh, processor in general, the data has to go via this pass, and if you access data locally, this is uh, much uh, quicker. And that's the uh, Intel TikTok model that I already mentioned. So Nihalem is the old ar architecture. Westmere uh, was a new production process for taking the same architecture, just adding a few cores. Uh, Sandy Bridge 
was, was a new architecture. It introduced some of the vectorization features we are going to talk about uh, later. And uh, I think Iverbridge was the name, was again then the production process improvement. It added two more cores and also increased the caches. And I'm not sure whether I'm allowed to talk about uh, the architectures following uh, thereafter. But that's a pretty reliable model. It will work for at least uh, another two or three years. And uh, then we will see uh, how computer architecture develops uh, from there. And these are just the numbers, so we can ignore the first uh, parts here. Uh, so if we take a look at the hier cache hierarchy, I said the first caches, uh, uh, meaning the first level caches close to the CPU are the smallest one, 32 kilobyte of instruction cache. This is where your program sits. And 32 kilobyte of data cache are directly attached to the core. On the current architecture, there's a 256 kilobyte level two cache. And it's already slower, so if you remember my measurements on this Westme AP architecture, um, there's already a notable difference. And then there are two and three mega or two or three megabyte of L3 cache per core, but then shared by all the cores. So six times three would be 18 megabyte of L3 cache directly uh, on the chip. And this uh, this pipeline trend that I mentioned that has stalled. So the Intel NetBurst architecture. I think this Pentium D was the last incarnation of this, was about 30 deaths. I had the deaths of about 30, so it was very small, very many uh, instructions. It was really designed to increase clock frequency to the order of 10 gigahertz. And uh, then Intel switched back to a completely different design. Uh, this was a core microarchitecture, and it currently still has 12 uh, stages. And this is not what you can clock up uh, to higher frequency and the frequencies and we are seeing them today. Well, and this is shared memory parallelization at a glance. So we have a shared data here. Oh, let me try to mo use a mouse pointer. We have the shared, shared memory here. We have two threads working independently from each other, but they are accessing the shared data and we have to synchronize the access uh, uh, to the shared data. That will be the challenge that we are facing later on. And what you can look for uh, small tasks, packages of work, things like that, that can, can be done simultaneously and independently, independently from each other. For example, you can parallelize the iteration uh, of a loop if all the loop iterations are independent. There was a single node, but as I said, that's by far not enough to uh, get uh, sufficient performance uh, to well, satisfy current HPC users. So what people are doing is they put multiple compute nodes together in order to form a cluster, which has a different kind of parallelism and which I call distributed memory parallelism. And this is because the second level interconnect, basically the network, is not cache coherent. So these small pictograms here are meant to illustrate a compute node. So I have two processors here with caches, interconnect and memory. They are all connected via this network, and if you remember my cluster diagram, uh, I well, I, I illustrated the network, what we have, it's a tree-like structure, and uh, in HPC, currently, the InfiniBand network is the most important representative. So when you do distributed memory parallelism, as it will be teached with the MPI uh, model tomorrow, the important thing is latency. So in many cases, these processes that are run on different compute nodes only have to share a small amount of data in between them. For example, if you do a domain decomposition, an important approach or often taken approach is to introduce ghost cells at the um, borders of your domain. So this is where you put some data to be read from other processors. So one compute node, one MPI process or whatever is responsible for one part of the computational domain but it has to share intermediate results with other MPI processes. But these in intermediate results are small compared uh, to the main memory or whatever. So we are sending very small messages and this is why the latency is important. And if you take a look, the latency I said sm smaller than five microseconds. I think in our network we are in the order of three microseconds. The latest and greatest InfiniBand that you could buy today is close to one microsecond. 
The bandwidth on our system, I think 1.5 gigabyte per second should be easily, be easily to measure, uh, maybe even more. Um, the latest and greatest InfiniBand might go to 3 gigabyte or 4 gigabyte per second. I don't have the numbers in my head here. If you compare it to gigabit Ethernet, if you go to 10 gig A, bandwidth would be comparable, comparable, but the latency would still be much higher. And for many parallel applications uh, in this distributed memory uh, space, the latency, as I explained, is the important factor. And this is how you compute um, uh, this distributed memory. You have multiple processes running independently from each other. And of course, they cannot take a look at other processes' memory because there's no coherent view of the main memory. So if this process wants to make some information available to another process, uh, process it has to actively transfer the variable A uh, to the other processor. And the other process or processor has to actu actually receive the other uh, variable uh, actively. And uh, the amount of parallelism that's going to be applied here in most cases is some kind of data parallelism where the big computational domain is cut into pieces which can be computed on independently. And that's an example from an application, so that's a 3D um, simulation where the stream of some fluid was simulated over this uh, kind of turbine, so it's actually uh, something that's implemented in people with a, a weak heart, a so-called ventricular assist device. Uh, so this uh, impeller was accelerating the blood and um, the color codes here indicate that these parts of the uh, geometry were dif distributed over multiple compute nodes. So multiple compute nodes were taken together to work simultaneously on this big problem. For once, it would be too large to be represented, represented in the memory of just one compute node. And second, if you use multiple processors for multiple compute nodes, you add more compute power and hence can solve the problem faster. And that's again as our uh, cluster, or oh, it doesn't show the tree-like structure, so we have to be precise, a fat tree topology. I think Tim will add a note on that. So this is the IB fabric, InfiniBand fabric, uh, that's connecting all the pieces in the cluster. We also have a gigabit Ethernet fabric uh, to get access to the file servers. But uh, for these MPI nodes, um, there's no explicit gigabit Ethernet fabric instead. This I.O. traffic uh, is uh, wrapped into this InfiniBand. And we have two file systems, an HPC parallel file system named Luster and a Hope file system, which is uh, still fast, but not, not as fast as the Luster. I think you will uh, learn more about that in Tim's uh, talk. But this is really what a cluster, or what comprises a cluster. You have many different compute nodes, possibly of different sizes, and uh, they are all connected by a single uh, high-speed, low-latency interconnect. And we will use the MPI programming style uh, that we will learn about uh, tomorrow to program those. Are there any questions on clusters? Um, any questions on me jumping from shared memory to these clusters? Okay, so far I had more questions than you, so I hope you will come up with more questions by the end of this talk, otherwise I win. I said that GP GP GPUs are very important in order to get more important, more performance if you want to stay within the same power budget. So the problem was in adding more processors and getting more performance, the problem was really the power. Uh, so there were some very special accelerators and then there came GPUs or GPGPUs. And the first GP in these GPGPUs stands for general purpose and this made them accessible in the especially in the HPC world. And the interesting thing is here that they add a lot of power uh, for some moderate amount, uh, so a lot of compute power for a moderate amount of electric power that they uh, consume. So actually I wanted to hide this slide. I wanted to show this slide. So if you take a look at the current top 500, something like 66% of the systems doesn't have any compute accelerations. All the others do have compute uh, acceleration. I'm not sure from when this are. Ah, it's from June 2013. Well, 
it's good that it's put in here. And the most dominant compute accelerations, as you can see here, are NVIDIA-based GP GPUs, because NVIDIA is very active in this domain and also comes up with its own uh, programming uh, languages. And uh, I will briefly go over the architectural details of NVIDIA cards and then take a look at Intel Xeon Phi architectures uh, later on. So as I said, GPGPU stands for General Purpose Programmable Graphics Processing uh, Units. And uh, the difference here is if a host CPU has eight cores, the GPU has 2,880 uh, 2 cores. I think that's numbers from the current Kepler, but I'm not completely sure. Dirk, Kepler? No idea. Kepler, Sander? Yes, so that's Kepler. I think that's the latest and greatest uh, GPGPU from NVIDIA. So if you're, well, I mean, NVIDIA can build something which has 2,900 2, cores, roughly. Is Intel capable of building only eight cores in that CPU? No, there's clearly a difference. So these are full-featured cores. They can run your program. They can do I.O. They can do many different things. These are very special cores, but there are many. And that's the main difference, and that's how you, I think you should take a look at it. So GPUs came from showing vertices on the screen, updating vertices. So they are very good at applying one technique, like adding a color code or whatever, changing the color code, to a big amount of data. So for example, if you want to change the picture in a 3D, a 3D scene and you want to rotate it, you do a matrix multiplication, basically. That's what they can do very, very well. And this is what these many, many cores are for. So they can compute very limited function, limited in expressiveness, limited in capability. But if you can match your function or fit your program function into these cores, you have a lot or a high degree of parallelism that can give you uh, very good performance. And this is how you think of you have to think for it. So CPUs can provide low latency memory access. They have these caches and things like that. You have a very complex control logic. CP GPUs only work for data parallel computations. Like if you have this vector field or this, this 3D, this, this matrix, and you apply um, uh, some kind of rotation, which is basically a matrix matrix uh, multiplication. And you throw just very, very many computations on the card, and um, this is uh, then exploited by these cores more or less automatically. More remarks on a second. And uh, they invest most of the transistors only for computation. And this is why they are more efficient if you take a look at the theoretical flop performance or peak performance um, of GPUs compared to CPUs when you also take a look at the power consumption. And that's a structure plot of the NVIDIA uh, Kepler. So what I wanted to show here only is in single precision, they have something like 2.5 teraflops. In double precision, they offer something like 1.2 teraflops of peak. Who can remember the peak performance of the West Mini P processor? Yes, so about 80, 72, right. 72, but not 72 teraflops, but 72 megaflops. So we're talking a different order of magnitude here. Gigaflops, I'm sorry, that's true, ju but just one order of magnitude, so, right. Uh, 72 gigaflop uh, to 1.2 teraflops. That's a difference, but you have to do a lot in order to exploit uh, that. And it also consumes uh, slightly more power, or more power than uh, a corresponding host processor. So the GPU, as the kernel, as these cores are not capable to run a full program, have to be programmed with so-called kernels. And the kernel is a very small part of your program, uh, maybe a compute kernel or something like that, which is simple enough to be exited by these compute uh, codes. And then the same kernel is executed by all these many, many, many GPU cores. But each kernel works on a slightly different uh, partition of the data. And uh, this is illustrated uh, here, so there's an um, uh, well, an enumeration, enumeration scheme on how the threads, which is then executed on each of these cores, uh, identifies within the kernel on which, which data it has to uh, access. And uh, there's this uh, hierarchical mapping 
of the threads um, uh, in blocks and grids, and there's different terminology. I'm always confusing that between OpenACC and CUDA. Uh, but uh, I like this, this diagram. So here's one kernel. Uh, so here's this kernel. It has a 2D representation. And uh, it performs a blocking on some data, and all these uh, cores also share some uh, some data uh, within caches. It's the same as optimi or It's very similar uh, to optimizing uh, cache access on regular hosts. And the actual threads have an ID like this in these three domains. And this is, for example, how you can define uh, the threads to work on independent parts of this matrix matrix computation. And the CPU is very efficient in switching between these kernels. You have to really be able to throw thousands of threads onto the CPU in order to exploit, uh, GPU, sorry, in order to exploit the performance. And this is what I meant. The thread works on a small core. Then there's, uh, oh no, it still doesn't say what the terminology is. This is CUDA or OpenACC. That's CUDA, thank you. So the, the thread works on a single core. Then there's a block, which, for example, can share uh, some caches. For example, they work on the same data. And then there's a grid that works um, uh, in which they are grouped, uh, again, sharing more uh, memory on the GPGPU. What's my last slide? So that's underlining this memory hierarchy. Um, we have the global memory. Um, which is something up and, uh, no, that's a global memory of the GPU. And up and coming in these uh, CUDA and other languages is that the global memory can be kind of unified with the main memory. Uh, this is probably not part of the OpenACC talk on, on Friday, but it's kind of the future. However, that, that unified memory doesn't come for free, so data still has to be copied. So we have a global memory on the GPU, it has its own memory in the order of 8 gigabyte, I think, on our devices. It's very fast, high bandwidth, but only if enough threads ask for it. Then we have L2 caches, uh, I think, per uh, grid. And we have then uh, smaller caches uh, for different threads. And again, you see a cache hierarchy, um, which is important to exploit perfor for performance. And programming GPGPUs will be covered on Friday with the OpenACC uh, paradigm. OpenMP4 also offers some uh, features to approaches, and I think we'll cover this on Thursday when we take a look at the mic architecture from Intel, because this is what we at the moment have uh, implementations for. And uh, so I need two more minutes in order to introduce the mic, and then I'm uh, done, I think. So with GPUs catching up in the top 500, 500 and um, also in, in the HPC market elsewhere, Intel had to react, and uh, they came up with a MIC architecture, which stands for many integrated cores. And these products are now called Intel Xeon Phi. And um, so what they have is 60 cores at 1.1 gi uh, gigahertz, and then four hardware threads per core, like hyper-threading, uh, but they call it differently. So this is something in between. So the host has at the moment eight cores, eight fat cores, with large caches, three gigahertz, complex out-of-order instructions, things like that. We have the GPU, 3,000 cores, very, uh, well, very limited functionality. But if you can map your kernel there, you get very high performance, something like, I don't know, 1.5 um, teraflop of peak performance, I already forgot. And in between, have we have the Xeon 5, which is 60 cores times two, so we have 240 logical co cores in this uh, configuration. It's a full 86x86 86 core, but it's running at only 1.1 megahertz, gigahertz. And it's also enabled to do some special operations like I.O. So it's kind of in between. At the moment, it's an uh, accelerator or coprocessor that can be plugged into the PCI Express uh, slot of a host, similar to an NVIDIA graphics card or any other graphics card. In the future, it will be something they can actually put into uh, a socket. And in order to get performance from the Xeon file, you have to vectorize. So the idea here is if you have these data types, so these are array elements, A0, A1, and so on, and you add two vectors, 
you get well the result vector, and we have 512 bit wide vector uh, registers. So all these operations can be performed simultaneously, and that's vectorization. I think Frank will uh, go into detail uh, that after the uh, coffee break, and uh, well the Xeon Phi has a theoretical peak performance of close to a uh, teraflop here. So it's an architecture in between. Uh, in theory, it can be programmed just like the host, but of course, you have to be much more parallel, and you really have to vectorize in order to get the performance. So it, it's not as simple as programming your host or taking your OpenMP program to the Xeon Phi and getting uh, better performance. It's a very simple core. I'm not going into do uh, detail here, but the single core performance of the Xeon Phi compared to a current uh, Sandy Bridge, for example, or the Westmere, it's about an order of magnitude slower. So that's not only the clock frequency, 1.1 on the Phi uh, to about 3 gigahertz on the standard Xeon. It's also about several other architectural optimizations or features that are not present on the Xeon Phi. So the fr this Xeon Phi, I think, has a core, which is, I'm not remembering the name, it's a very old Intel Atom uh, device. Uh, but the important thing here is this is an in-order execution, so it cannot produce uh, multiple results simultaneously. It also has its own uh, memory. It has 8 gigabyte of GDDR5 memory, again, high bandwidth, lower latency, but it can also access data uh, from the host. And this is the basic architecture, so all the cores are organized in a ring with the caches in between. In theory, there could be a difference, like in the memory. So when on the memory side, we had non-uniform memory. Uh, we could talk about NUCA, non-uniform cache architecture. But Intel is using some, which I think, clever algorithm to hide all that. So all the cores are in integrated in the ring. But uh, thanks to this algorithm, they see the same latency and bandwidth to bo both the caches and uh, the memory. It's just 60 of them, each capable of executing four threads simultaneously. And that's in the configuration. So we have the compute node with, uh, for example, two Xeon uh, processors. I think Westmere is the latest and greatest that we can offer, which eight cores at uh, uh, only two gigahertz. They have 16 gigabyte of DDR3 memory as a main memory. And there's a PCI Express and an accelerated compute node on the other side of the PCI. You either have the NVIDIA GPGPU or you have the Intel Xeon Phi coprocessor. And our systems are equipped with two coprocessors or two NVIDIA GPUs. Um, um, for, well, for whatever reason, there are two of them uh, in every system, which has turned out to be the sweet spot for some applications. And uh, again, data has to be transferred from the main memory to the device and possibly uh, back again. And that's that's a challenge in accelerator program. I mean, you have to really understand when to transfer data from the host to the device and back. The only notable difference between the Xeon Phi, the mic, and the NVIDIA is that you can also consider this as an individual system. So there's a Linux, run Linux running on the mic, and you can start a single program on the mic without any involvement of the host, which is, uh, again, the first step or an indication that uh, future generations of this product will be capable to be plugged into a socket on their own. And that's it for my overview of compute architecture. So I talked about many things. The idea is I talk within my voice, my formulation. The important cover topics will be covered by the individual speakers later on again, so you will hear it in a different voice, different uh, kind of explaining things so that the important things hopefully will find uh, their way into your mind. I talked about um, many of these different processors. The most important thing to take away is that we have to deal with many cores for a while, probably not thousand big fat Xeon cores, but we have thousands of GPU cores already, and we have in the order of 100 Xeon Phi cores in current and future products, so the future is parallel. You have to program it, and uh, the future is also uh, lives in vectors. Uh, uh, Frank will cover that later on. And um, I think if you take a look at the slides mm, and lean back, you will see that optimization for where's my data on a network will come again and again. Parallelism to be exploited by cores, so in 
uh, well, exploiting parallelism in your algorithm, that the theme that will come again and again. And then the memory hierarchy is also something that you find everywhere. There are caches, there's NUMA, and uh, within accelerators you have the same. And if you take a look at the whole host, you have a memory hierarchy from the L1 cache of a Xeon core uh, to the main memory of the GPGPU. And uh, further architectures will merge everything kind of together. Um, and uh, there will still be a memory hierarchy probably even deeper. That's it for my point of view. I'm already over time, as usual. Uh, there's coffee outside, but I'm still available for a question, if you like.